Well, welcome everybody today for our Hydro Terra webinar series. It's great to see so many of you attending today and we really appreciate your time. Today, we're talking about improving agricultural productivity with technology. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Scott McKinnon from DPI in New South Wales to tell us all about the latest and greatest available there and how they are helping uh, to get industry to adopt this technology to ultimately help them. So let's get into it. So firstly, uh, in terms of who's speaking here, it's myself talking right now, Richard Campbell, Managing Director of HydroTerra and I will be assisting Scott. Uh, Scott McKinnon uh, is Program Leader, Farms of the Future for New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and Agriculture. A little bit about our presenter today. So Scott has over 25 years of sales and marketing experience with a practical commercial agribusiness background and an applied technology focus. He's worked extensively in Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pacific, and globally based in Switzerland. He has led several innovation projects, testing and evaluating technology, agronomic modeling applications on farm, and has specialized in commercial business best practice. For the latter part of his career, he has specialised in the ag tech space, in senior management roles for local and international startups, consulted to corporate agribusiness and led lead producer focused technology initiatives. He is the program leader for the $48 million Future Ready Regions, Farms of the Future program with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry. And today in this presentation, we're going to hear really quite a bit of background about how New South Wales Department of Primary Industry is helping through these programs to get farming up to the next level of adoption of IoT. Just before we launch into Scott's presentation, a few things. One of the things we really like is your feedback and Scott is very keen to get questions um, both about IoT but also about the program itself. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. To raise a question, click on the Q&A and type into that. And at the end of this presentation, I will read out those questions and Scott and myself will do our best to answer them. If we can't answer them today, we will get back to you. So we keep a record of those questions. So please keep the questions coming. Why does HydroTerra run this webinar series? We like to share knowledge. Uh, we like to share the knowledge of both, uh, you know, specialist monitoring technology as well as to provide a platform for people such as Scott who have something to say to industry, which we think is valuable to get out there. So we'd like to help with that. We also like to facilitate education. So we see this as a good way to train industry and uh, certainly feel we're getting some good momentum around that. But lastly, and most importantly, and this is where the Q&A comes into it, we'd like to understand the needs of the industry so we can uh, help serve you better. So on to today's program, we've covered the introduction and I'm about to hand over to Scott, who's going to talk to us about improving agricultural productivity with technology, where to start. So welcome Scott, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks Richard. Um, just want to jump to the first slide. Um, Richard asked, has asked me to be involved in the webinar series today because uh, in between my two Farms of the Future projects, I was um, setting up some climate resilience projects, which are 
Richard and the Maloon Institute uh, put an expression of interest in, and um, he'll talk about that later. But during our regular catch-ups, we tended to drift up subject and talked about ag tech and ag tech adoption, building awareness uh, quite often and what's happening in that field. And when I was giving him an overview of some of the activities New South Wales DPI is involved in in that space, he thought it'd be uh, good if I could share my insights into the programs I've been involved in, but also in general, some of the activities that New South Wales DPI is working on in the IoT space. So thanks Richard for that opportunity and hopefully I can uh, generate some interest. If you just skip to the next slide. Um, this slides are what they call a technology readiness level. Um, it's, a, it's a standard sort of assessment of technology, not just in ag tech, but uh, across the board from one at the research stage where you've got an idea and building a concept right through to fully commercialized application. The DPI in different divisions is working right across all nine of these levels. Um, the, the three inside ones you see there, Farms of the Future 1 and 2 and Climate Smart Pilots is our activities being run by the Climate Branch under DPI Agriculture, which is what I'm part of. There's also some activities in the, in the research station and the research station side. So I'm going to um, run through the, the Climate Smart and Farms of the Future components today, but it's also just important to be aware that we do have some fantastic facilities at New South Wales DPI in um, the global ag tech ecosystem called the GATE, which is an incubator program for um, getting ag technology startups off the ground. Uh, it's been running for about three years now and has had some really successful people through the program. Sorry, is that better? And yep. um, Yep, and there's also some activity around uh, activating the, the DPI research stations with, with LoRaWAN for research and, and commercial operations as well. So there's another program around that. So if we jump onto the next slide, please, Richard. Uh, the Climate Smart Pilots is a, a, a group of programs and activities under the Climate Change Research Strategy, which the uh, DPI Climate Branch has multiple programs and streams running. Climate Smart Pilots uh, is in two sections. And the first section was really around building an open, open sensor network. And that was backed off some previous work we did in the farm decision tech space uh, in the very early days of, of LoRaWAN and LoRaWAN connectivity. Um, and it's focused at building open networks in agricultural areas and then working with producers to get them on board with that technology. Skip to the next slide, please. So those programs are in four different sectors at this point in time. So there's a, um, a very large fisheries uh, oyster monitoring program down in Batemans Bay, an irrigated cropping research program in lateral move out at Trangy. Uh, Large-scale livestock IoT work uh, at Tullamore, looking at various parts of measuring and what we can measure to help uh, producers be more resilient and more adaptable to climate. And then around Orange, a horticultural uh, orchard program as well. Now, if you want more information on these particular pilots, uh, that's available on the New South Wales DPI Climate webpage. Uh, and also on the farm decision tech webpage, which you can get to through there. And some of this data is accessible um, to the public and results are accessible on that site as well. Thanks, Richard. So the second part of the Climate Smart Pilots is really around demonstrating adaptation. Um, and this is where I came into contact with, with Richard because what we are really looking at in, in this perspective is not technology focused. Um, it's linked to the, to the same program, but it's really around looking at activities which are producers are already doing themselves on properties to, to manage climate challenges and to build resilience. And then where possible fund those to expand them or to build more capability on top of those. And then really bring that 
out into the market by building case studies and running field days around those situations. So we've got four programs which uh, are just kicking off now under that program. One's out at Cobar, it's around land management and trying to get better moisture infiltration in that particular area. Um, we're looking at one in, in Young around precision agriculture and having a very high resolution precision agriculture so that we can have more timely management of, of climatic change conditions. Building on the farm farming forecaster program with uh, the Manara Farmer Systems in the south and building some technology around about um, pasture management in, in drought conditions. And then one which Richard will say a few words about later is uh, where Hydra Terra are working with Maloon Institute and the DPI around some regeneration modeling and hopefully building uh, a tool that we can bring out to market to, to show people where those activities are, can be successful. Thanks, Richard. I think everyone's aware that previously there's been a lot of uh, adoption challenges with IoT in agriculture and the first one is really having the right connectivity. A lot of the work I've been working on in the pilot program and the expanded program now with Farms of the Future is around connectivity, but also around the devices on farm. But it can be seen here um, in this adoption curve that agriculture is a long way behind a lot of other industry sectors. And I think that's really at a point now it's changing. There's a lot more um, capability in the market. There's a lot more technology available. However, there's still some challenges which we're hoping to address with some of the programs which we're running, um, building on that user experience, building some more information around that value proposition. And I know there's a lot of other industry bodies looking at this as well. And then building on that interoperability factor so that technology that producers do select can be used into the future and can link into previous and, and new technologies coming along. Thanks, Richard. So in 2019, uh, the DPI was given some funding by the New South Wales State Government to do some field work to build information and evaluate, evaluation going into a, a business case under the Snowy Hydro Legacy Fund. So looking at how the New South Wales Government can provide better connectivity in regional areas and specifically in this project, they're looking at farm and water environment and, and connectivity at a paddock level. Uh, a business case is being put together by external consultants for the government to look at ways that they could engage in the market and, and support that. And there was some questions around grower awareness and capability and how that could be built. So we um, set up three demonstration farms, one at Canamble, one at Narromine and one at Blaney. They were set up with uh, commercially available products only, so it wasn't research uh, or development. It was how can we enable existing technology and, and build on that. And we were really looking at the grower experience uh, on installing and using that technology, looking to identify any potential gaps if we wanted to facilitate scale in this particular market. We looked across multiple sectors in three different geographies uh, and installed um, comparable commercially available products on those properties. The concept at the time was that we were going to run a series of field days, bring in producers, build some training and awareness, get them out in the paddock, look at the technology, talk to the producers that we were working with, have access to talk to the suppliers. However, we all know what happened in 2019. So field days were uh, really off the table for us. We had a really short deadline to be able to provide some evaluation into that program. So we had to switch our path and we then looked at doing that in an online environment. So we did a lot of electronic work, produced some uh, really nice video content of the producers for case studies, which people could view. We built some virtual farms with a bit of aug augmented reality technology, which was uh, nice to work with, uh, not as good as being on farm and, and looking and 
talking to the producer, but people could actually zoom around the properties and have a look at some of the technology. And then we ran a series of webinars. So to try and recreate the field day event, we had three webinars uh, a week apart. First one, introducing ag tech. The second one, running through the farmer case studies and, and having those collaborators actually speak, uh, as well as watching their videos. And the third one was really having the suppliers speak about their experience in the program. Do you want to slip to the next one? Thanks, Richard. So out of that program, uh, we developed a, a user experience review. So we had a, a consultant work with the collaborators and interview them and look for their experience with getting the hardware set up, installed some of the challenges, some of the successes, and then actually what they were using and what they weren't using out of that technology to, to feed back into the business case. We had three really good operational pilot sites, which would have been fantastic to run some field days, but we didn't, we didn't get to that. We have the webinar series and the web resources are all on the, on the climate webpage. So anyone's interested, uh, you can go and look at those tools. They're still live. Also started to build a ag tech industry and grow a database. Obviously key part of the pilot program was survey and evaluation, which was fed back into the business case as well. And then um, we worked with Tokal Ag College and um, Darren Price, who is one of our um, consultants on the program. And we've put together an ag guide, which is under the Tokal Ag Guide program called uh, An Introduction to Ag Tech. That's uh, currently a print at the moment and will be launching sometime in November. And that'll be available from Tokal. But that's a really practical guide uh, written by Darren around identifying your pain points, understanding some of the technology, understanding some of the challenges and successes around ag tech, but then also linking that into our three case studies. So we've got some really good practical examples in there and, and some feedback from the actual producers. So there are a few things which I learned from uh, this two year program and installing and setting up ag tech and and one of those is when you're talking about anything with radio frequencies is, is towers. So we seem to have to find high spots and put up towers or put antennas on existing towers. And that varied from, you can see some of the images here from the top of windmills to the top of silos to uh, one of our collaborators uh, sourcing a secondhand TV antenna off one of their neighbors uh, and along with being remote and, and having towers is actually getting power to places. So some of the considerations are, you know, what's your landscape look like? What are your power resources and what are the power requirements of some of those devices and networks that we'll be setting up? I'm gonna jump to the next one. And the second really strong insight was, uh, was landscape, which I just put under the term trees and hills. Being flat isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, we did have some challenges in some of the flat country with uh, just simply trying to get radio signals and connectivity through trees. Um, and as you can see in the, in the map there of our site at Blaney, it was uh, extremely hilly terrain and we had to put in multiple gateways to get covery and in some spots we couldn't. So we went to satellite or things like rain gauges in more remote parts of the property. So looking at um, that sort of multiple connectivity options uh, was something that we had to do on most of the situations to get the right information from the different landscapes. So what were our successes? All the producers were really happy with water monitoring. We had various types of water monitoring from tanks, troughs, to pipe flows, to even you see the photo there, putting sensors onto creeks so they could tell when the creek was either flooding or was dry, uh, saved on travel time, saved on getting to remote places uh, at strange time, middle of the night, going down to check pumps and things like that, and could help with maintenance time. So identifying issues early. The second one was surveillance. Cameras for livestock surveillance and for security. Um, 
all the producers were really happy with, with surveillance, getting cameras out there. But as we know, cameras require bandwidth. So we did um, need to put in Wi-Fi in some of those situations or have really good 4G connectivity. But being able to monitor things without having to leave where you're working, whether it's the office or the home, or being able to dial them up on your phone when you're mobile uh, was really beneficial. And the third one on two of the sites we had uh, in Paddock Weighing, which both of those producers were really happy with, just being able to see the progress of a, of a mob of cattle and how it's going without having to guess, without having to get them in the yards and weigh them, just made there was better time management for when they were getting those cattle in uh, for various different purposes. Some of the challenges we said, we, we found, as I mentioned before, was uh, yeah, working with radio, installation, trees, topography, antennas, um, not insurmountable, but just something that needs to be considered. And then the other challenge was animal damage. Uh, I think we incurred every type of animal damage possible from birds covering solar panels to hares and wallabies chewing cables and cattle being able to somehow get through cattle guards and still rip antennas off with their tongues. They're very inquisitive. So just some considerations there with uh, installations for sure is, you know, what are the, the challenges around animals? Thanks, Richard. So now I'd like to move on to farms of the future. So we were uh, very fortunate in the fact that with our pilot program and the information that we did provide into the, the uh, proposal, along with a lot of industry consult consultation that the consultants did that uh, was announced in June in the, in, the government that, in the budget that they'd allocated $48 million to farms of the future for a, a major expansion over four years. Uh, New South Wales DPI was identified as a lead agency on that. So we've just uh, starting to kick off that program at the moment. It's a really great opportunity to build capability in the regions, lift knowledge and awareness around ag tech and actually get some ag tech out on farm. This program will be run in 11 LGAs uh, across those sort of five main aggregated areas and cover multiple agricultural sectors. So focused on red meat sector, grains, cotton, and horticulture. So it's going to be a really fantastic opportunity, uh, not only in those LGAs, but across the state to, to build capability and awareness and, and knowledge at a producer level, but also um, through the advisor network and just across the whole industry. So we'll be there's a large focus on building that capability and awareness. I'm going to jump to the next one, please, Richard. So the program is uh, mapped out across multiple streams. The first stream at the moment, which is where we are, um, as we're talking today, is really at that program initiation stream. So setting up the project team, um, building all the ways of working. We're, the scope, we're already scoping uh, the five potential uh, sites in those LGAs. Uh, in those particular locations, we're planning to set up uh, information hubs with, with demo sites. At this point in time, they'll be um, on New South Wales DPI research stations so we can get really good access for producers and to be able to run workshops, potentially field days, demos, and, and potentially even have some drop-in times where people can, can just come in and look at the tech and, and talk to a development officer there who can answer some of their questions and help them through the journey. One of the key things I mentioned before on, on the back of our ag guide is we're going to build a, an education and awareness program. So we're working with TOCAL at the moment on designing both a workshop format plus an online format. So really bringing the, the concepts in the book alive. We're building that tool so that it can be used by not only us in this program, but can be picked up by, by industry and others to be, to be used as well. So alongside of that 
program that will be part of uh, the producer eligibility going forward in those LGAs. So the idea is that we can work directly in groups or potentially online with producers that are wanting to get into this space. Um, and they'll run through that program and come out with a device plan. So we're really looking at taking them through that process of defining what they need or what's possibly some of the best options for them in ag tech and connectivity options uh, for their particular situation. So we found in the pilot, even though there were some similarities across just our three farms that we were using, every situation was specific and different and different technologies worked better in uh, different situations. So it's, a, it's a really a personalized program to go through. In those particular LGAs, there's some really good existing LoRaWAN networks, but we'll be building on the back of that and filling in some of the black spots in those networks and providing access to existing LoRaWAN networks for, for producers in those areas. And then we're going to launch in 2023 into a grants program. So we'll be looking at working with the producers which are eligible in those LGAs, which have been through the program to provide assistance to get on board with ag tech. That program will have two rounds in 2023 and 2023, 24, sorry. And um, it won't be limited to, to LoRaWAN technology. That'll be open technology and include other forms of localized farm connectivity if producers have that as their need. Thanks, Richard. That's pretty much the, the wrap up of the current program. It is uh, very early days. We're um, just in the process of setting up our team. A lot of those streams of work have already commenced to some degree. And really at this point in time, we're getting out there and engaging with uh, stakeholders, whether it's suppliers, vendors or, or industry bodies to make sure that we can build the right partnerships to make it successful. Well, thanks, Scott. That was, uh, that was great. And uh, I guess in terms of a bit of a summary of uh, what I think uh, were the key takeouts of this is uh, that agriculture is lagging behind other sectors and there are reasons for that. Um, in my opinion, having sort of dealt quite a lot in this area, um, if we cast our minds back about sort of six years ago in Victoria, we had a lot of money spent. Um, I think it was originally associated with the sale of Telstra to automate a whole lot of water reticulation, but there wasn't the underlying sort of service network to maintain it. So in the end, there was a bit of a disconnect there. So it's sort of important to get the whole business ecosystem around it so lots of money went in but without the support network around it in the end the farmers didn't really embrace that adoption and that that was that was the early days of I guess uh, automation around mobile phones and you and using those uh, cellular networks to control things so some learnings around that and I think we've come a long way and it's it's tremendous to see that support around getting connectivity happening now. But ag is lagging, and but what's really exciting, in, in my opinion, is the potential is, is just starting to be realised around combining not only uh, IoT and, and sort of what Scott's focused on a fair bit today, but also uh, more of the satellite analysis tools that can be combined with that to produce uh, predictive tools. So when you combine the Bureau of Met data with your on-ground sensing data and those sorts of things, you can really start to have foresight in how to manage your properties better. So it's very, very powerful. And it's there is a huge number of players coming into this area. Uh, the second thing is the value proposition piece. I think this is a really good point, you know, like do you really need something remote to measure how much water you've got in a trough? Uh, 
or how much water is remaining in a dam or how well your reticulation is working? Well, the answer to that is, is very farm specific. And I think what we heard in Scott's program is that, that it is farm specific, but they're going to offer a, a service here for uh, people who want to take it up to, to actually look at Richard? I think we've lost Richard Marcio. Yeah, uh, Scott, if you wanna uh, just uh, keep talking about the, the, the kids, yeah, would be great. Yeah, Thank I think building, building on Richard's uh, comment where he started talking around the, the value proposition and the return on investment, I think there's still a long way to go to, to make that easier to understand it's it's a challenge that i think everyone's trying to ad address um and I'm, I'm sure the market is trying to do that as well and i know there's some industry bodies looking at trying to address that as well um, we had some really good verbals uh, from our producers around different benefits they got and and quite often it's just it's peace of mind to know that something's functioning and you don't have to worry and go and check it but Obviously, with, with things like water monitoring, it's not that difficult for producers to do their own calculations of how many times they go and check a particular trough tank or irrigation site, how long it takes them, how much they travel, what's the wear and tear. I think those sort of ROIs are, are, are pretty good to do on you know, the back of an envelope yourself. But then again, it's some of the more complex decision-making uh, which I think is harder to, to get a handle on. But that's part of our um, expanded program is definitely looking at case studies within some of those producers which come on the program and where we can build out some really uh, more granular uh, ROI around that. I think some of the other points Richard had there, um, we mentioned water monitoring, ir irrigation optimization, probably very similar. Cameras was, was really interesting. Um, having access to live footage or, or even just recorded footage, all of our collaborators really put high up the list. It's probably one of the most expensive and uh, yeah, resource dependent parts, especially when you're looking at um, pushing live video uh, all around your property. But some of the benefits that, that our collaborators saw, um, one of our cattle producers had a very large pan tilt zoom camera. So basically a, a camera on top of his shed that you can remote control from your office or your phone. And when he had his heifers in the yard um, carving, he could actually just have a quick look without having to drive up to the, uh, the cattle yards every half an hour or an hour and, and just give him peace of mind that they're, they're okay, they weren't down, that they were still walking around. Uh, the same with one of our other producers which had a set of sheep yards a long way away from their, um, their house. And when they had sheep there overnight or during the day, they could uh, simply just dial in and have a look and make sure that everything was, was going okay. And then when you look at security, um, especially with the uh, still cameras, which were taking time-lapse photography, our producers could actually come in and, and look at images from their sheds or around their farm overnight just to make sure that everything was okay and uh, there hadn't been any security issues. So I think uh, there's some really solid benefits uh, in, in those areas, um, but it also is probably a challenge to get set up correctly. The in paddock weighing uh, was really interesting. It was pretty new technology when we brought it on board. Um, has been getting a lot of media coverage, um, but we uh, we got well. We we're planning to get one unit and move it around the the three properties, but uh, we took it to our first collaborator, and essentially they wouldn't let it go. So we had to. Um, go and source another unit for the second property. 
uh, and, and I believe both of those collaborators have, have kept those units after that program um, finished. And just, I think it's the same thing, just knowing what's happening remotely, um, being able to see those aggregated weights go up or level out or just to be able to monitor that. I mean, one of the stories our produce, one of the producers told us was they, they had a remote property which was um, several kilometres walk to the, the neighbour's cattle yard so they could weigh the cattle. So simply by understanding what the mob weight averages were doing, they could actually time better getting those cattle in to actually weigh them properly. Uh, historically, they said they are either three weeks too early or two weeks late to get to the weights they wanted, whereas now they could get a better handle on what's happening with the mob without actually having to go and handle them and move them and weigh them, weigh them properly. I'm not sure whether we've got Richard back on, have we, Richard? Is he? Yeah, Scott, I think we, we don't have Richard still okay. back. So maybe we can move to the uh, questions and yeah. answers. And then, yeah. So I, th I think you are able to yep. read, to read and, and then, now. yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, there's a message here from Luke around, have we only considered LoRaWAN for low bandwidth uh, monitoring? Uh, no, LoRaWAN is just one of, the, one of the backgrounds. We're also looking at leveraging existing networks wherever possible, whether that's a, a 4G network or uh, NBIOT or LTMs, um, and now with, with satellite as well. So once we do get to the actual device side of things, we'll be, we'll be connectivity agnostic as long as it fits with the, the producer's needs. And as I mentioned before, also looking at uh, on-farm Wi-Fi one for the benefits of being able to add security cameras, but also for Wi-Fi calling in, in parts of the property where um, you, you don't get normal 3, 4G signal. So that's, uh, that's really important to have that connectivity, especially in remote, remote places. I'm back, Scott. Sorry about that. You're Zoom, right. uh, Zoom uh, kicked me out. I've covered, covered your bit for you, Richard. Excellent work. Did you talk about the Maloon Institute as well? No, but you, you can do that before I jump on to the next question, if you like. Okay. Um, Richard, if you want to show your screen, I'm going to. Thank you. Okay. I will. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Um, I'll just take you back to a photo early in the presentation, which this photo on the bottom right is uh, a portion of the catchment that uh, the Maloon Institute manages. So uh, I think. Um, this particular project might be a bit of a vision for the future. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is a vision for the future in quite a few applications. So the project is about rehydrating landscapes and Hydroterra was engaged to monitor the effectiveness of, of doing this. So this, this is the Maloon Creek in the picture here. And it's about how we can adapt the landscape um, to be more drought resilient by holding more water in the landscape. So the flood plains, which stretch out across various portions of the catchment provide a target for rehydration. And by putting in leaky weir structures of which one you can see in that photo, you can retain water in there to increase recharge of those floodplain areas and therefore you have more water storage in your aquifers and in your soil moisture storage to handle the, uh, the ups and downs of rainfall 
uh, and you know, climate extremes. So our challenge was to monitor that, to, to check on its effectiveness. And that project's been really good at really seeing the value of both real-time monitoring data measured uh, both through the surface water bodies that you're seeing there. So whether it's levels of water in those stream reaches or flow, or whether it's the real-time soil moisture within the floodplains, that's been combined with um, satellite data um, to provide ways of scaling that data because it's always difficult to scale from just a sensor point up to you know whole of catchment and you need tools that allow you to do both. So sensors are great at looking at dynamics of systems and satellite data is great at looking at space the spatial context of that as well as providing us with insights of how that changes with time. So this is a project which um, got federal funding about four million dollars to really look at at those processes. Uh, the learnings um, and where this project's heading is there's some real opportunity for farmers to be looking at ancillary benefits like carbon uh, and uh, carbon credits and biodiversity credits. So part of this project is looking at how to quantify those and ultimately how to link them to um, actual financial mechanisms to, to sell those credits, right? So um, it's been an interesting project and it's, it's required the use of the cellular telemetry networks it's got a network of, um, oh goodness, I've forgotten the numbers, about 45 odd um, soil moisture capacitance probes and all hooked up to telemetry and a network of about 100 groundwater piezometers to allow us to quantify the groundwater storage and the soil moisture storage. It's also got two climate stations, also telemetered which help us to really understand the overall water balance of the site. Um, this is really to prove up, you know, whether or not rehydration's working, what will be very interesting and the real power out of this will be combining it with that satellite data to look at how one can predict uh, and quantify biodiversity changes, soil health changes and that sort of thing and develop the methods that can be used as indicators of those credits that I spoke about. So it's a really great project to be involved in. And uh, many thanks to Scott and their program for funding a, another step in this project really, which is to look at where does catchment rehydration make most sense to do? And that is about doing a spatial analysis, you know, using a range of different data sets to look at where do we get best return on investment from undertaking rehydration activities? Because it doesn't make sense to do it everywhere, right? Um, so, we uh, have just commenced that project. Uh, DPI has just announced their project manager for the job. And uh, out of that exercise, we will be developing a heat map to, of the state of New South Wales with where that, uh, that process can be optimised um, and where we can see lots of uh, revegetation and a better farm performance and uh, better resilience to drought. Um, so that's that's probably it around the Maloon Institute and uh, many thanks to Scott for funding that one. Uh, so we might go back to the Q&A questions. So next question is from Sunail Hasnain. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Is there any technology pilots in relation to groundwater monitoring? We didn't have any specifically focused on that. However, at all three of our collaborating farms, we did have uh, bore level sensors in. So that was essentially monitoring groundwater level on that particular
property. Um, one of those was um, an irrigation bore on a vineyard. One was a stock bore uh, in a grazing enterprise. And the other was an old stock bore, which was very close by a large irrigation bore. So looking at the almost the, the secondary levels and effect of that, of that bore. So that was really at the producer level. Uh, and that was information that they were interested in. And it was uh, essentially a water tank um, pressure sensor with an extremely long cable on it, which went down the bore and they could uh, monitor that those bore heights. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, next question, sorry. Uh, so thanks for that, Scott. So Wayne Evans, were you using the LoRaWAN network for any control activities, e.g. pump start, or was it mostly monitoring? Yeah, thanks. Our, in our particular um, sites, it was only monitoring, so it was only uh, one-way LoRaWAN. However, however, I know that the Climate Smart guys in their, in their horticulture program, which I mentioned earlier, have been doing um, two-way uh, control monitoring with LoRaWAN. So I know that they were uh, setting that up over the last six or eight months or so, but uh, I'm not over that project, so can't give you an update, but um, not in ours, but in others, yes. Okay, and have you found it reliable using LoRaWAN for control? Oh, I wasn't part of it, so I haven't, oh, I haven't, okay. I haven't done it myself. I haven't been involved in it. No worries. Sorry. All right. Next question from Roger Burrett. Are drones used in any of the pilots, e.g. are they used in the winery industry? Our pilots were specifically focused on devices needing connectivity backhaul. And generally at this point in time, drones are run by someone in the paddock. Uh, so we didn't use them in our pilot. We, we did use them for some of our augmented reality imagery and for our videos, which was really good. But we didn't, we didn't use them in an agricultural sense. Okay. Are you seeing uh, a lot more adoption of drones, Scott, like across the industry? I think a lot more practical use of them. Um, just from my personal observations in the market, there was a, uh, a run on them a few years ago and everyone got excited and um, there was a lot purchased, but I've seen a lot sitting on people's office desks and in boxes in the corner. Um, but I think now there's a lot more beneficial applications coming out. I think there's a lot more commercial use of drones. It'd be hard to comment on the producer use of drones. Um, but there's some really good commercial operators out there providing some excellent diagnostic tools based on, on imagery now a, as a package. So they'll, they'll come out, can fly whatever crop you've got, and then are partnered with uh, data analytics uh, uh, platforms which can provide you know, decision support insights. So do you see your program extending to those sorts of technologies as well? Not in this particular round of pilots, no. We're, we're focused on connectivity and the, enabling that connectivity and then the devices that go with that connectivity. Um, I think some of the information that will come from our program can be obviously leveraged with that drone imagery and other imagery to make better decisions. So really what we're providing is just one, one piece of the puzzle. As we know, ag tech is much bigger than just IoT and connectivity, especially when you look at imagery, remote imagery, and then um, a lot of the information that you're getting off machines today is, is pretty vast. Yeah, that's right. I'm not, I'm not sure that um, people always use it, right? So <laughs> sometimes there's more information than, than uh, they can keep up with. Um, in terms of LoRaWAN versus satellite telemetry and 
you know, this emergence of the micro satellite networks, and that sort of thing. Where do you see that heading, you know, in terms of um, being adopted on farms? Do you think LoRaWAN's going to be the most applicable for farmers? Or do you think there's a, a place for those micro satellite networks in the farming space? Well, we found it was, yeah, down to the individual situation, which is part of what we want to build into our training and awareness program is that you really need to go through that process and evaluate it. Uh, it depends on a whole lot of factors. Um, depends on your geography. Uh, depends on the number of devices. Depends on your the size and, and connectivity. So uh, it really comes down to determining what you do and needing that, doing the numbers. And it, it could be a combination of both, which is what we had at our Blaney site, where we had pretty good, we had really good LoRaWAN coverage across the vineyard. Bits of the grazing enterprise, but then there were places where all we wanted was a rain gauge. So there's no point putting up a LoRaWAN gateway for one rain gauge. So we used um, satellite rain gauges. So do you think, uh, you know, I've got a couple more questions here I should uh, ask, but do you see the LoRaWAN um, coverage, you know, extending statewide eventually, or do you think it's going to be clustered and... Oh, I think it's I think it's going to be clustered just by the nature of the the radio frequencies and how it works. Um, and as I said, it's a it's a bit like the rain gauge concept. There's no point installing a gateway for two devices when you can get that information probably um, by another mechanism, whether it's you know, LTEM, those sort of low bandwidth um, 4G type technologies or satellite or others. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, a comment here from Julian Smith. Good day, Julian. Just a comment that drones are being used more often by consultant agronomists for in crop management decisions. Do you have a view on that comment, Scott? Oh, I'd, I'd agree with it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, good I to hear. The, I think the challenge comes down to yeah, it's the ROI of your time. Really, I know yeah. a lot of them are using them in large broadacre scenarios to do scouting, so they can actually scout in the middle of paddocks rather than drive around the outside. Um, so it's a, it's a really ROI on time and and then that skill as well. Yeah. Uh, next question, uh, another question from Wayne Evans. Was there any specific information that came through from the pilots in relation? to the improvement of farm performance, e.g. 10% reduction in water use or X% percent productivity improvement? Uh, we didn't go to that level of evaluation. Uh, we were really looking at the, the grower experience and level of understanding of the technology. Um, we didn't really get into those economic evaluations. Um, I think if you dig around, you can probably find some stats on that. There, there were some very high level ones in the precision to decision work done in, I think, 2017. Um, yeah, so we didn't, we didn't provide that information out of our evaluation. It's certainly, um, it, it's one of the bigger challenges, right? So we're, we're working on that uh, in, in that Maloon project to look at, um, what are the methods to, to measure productivity? And uh, you know, what, are the, what are the key metrics that can be used and, and readily, readily measured? Um, I think it's a big part of the puzzle, isn't it? If you get those models right. Um, I know, you know packages like Maya grazing and that sort of thing start to head down that path. I think um, it is a big, a big thing that, that Wayne's raised there that if you can really get your metrics to align with your what you need to know about your productivity, then there'll be a lot more adoption of that technology. Yeah, I, a, I think that the, the most documented or well, best documented example would be using um, soil moisture probes in irrigation, which is you know, neutron probes have been used since the 80s, um, and there's some really good stats around water use efficiency and irrigation management and 
getting the timing right through just using that one device now with modern technology and, and connectivity that's probably not as accurate as a neutron probe, but some of the probes now you can have them one in each of your fields and you know, get that information a couple of times a day. So it's really around timeliness, I think now with the new technology that's out there. Yeah, it's certainly a bit easier with the water side of things to, to get the value proposition because you, you can measure everything pretty accurately. Um, and we're seeing that with some of these irrigation tools like Swan Systems where people are quite happy to pay quite a bit of money per pivot because they know they're getting that saving. So it's definitely moving that way. Um, we don't have any more open questions at the moment, but there are a few questions in the chat. I'll see if I can get those open. Um, I think all of those have been dealt with. Um, Q&A, two more. Maybe check the questions at the top too. Sounds like I might have missed a couple at the beginning. Um, no, I think that's uh, all the questions. So Scott, many thanks for presenting today. It's been great to, uh, oh, uh, Giuseppe's saying I've missed his question. Where is your question, Giuseppe? Oh, there's a couple more that have popped up, sorry. What's the best way to reach out to Scott with new technology that might be useful to the industry? That's from Teal Watkins. Uh, if you just go to the New South Wales NSW DPI climate, Google that and go to the uh, farms of the future page. The details should be there. But there's also a um, web form at the bottom where you can register interest. So just fill that in and uh, type your comments down the bottom. There's actually a free text part at the bottom of that or, or contact Richard. Good answer there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of, there's a question from Roger Burrett. Is the electricity cost increased by much with adoption of these technologies? Um, I would say no, especially with LoRaWAN, it's low power. So essentially your devices in the paddock run off a battery for several years or a very small solar panel. Um, probably the cost of getting remote power was, was something which was uh, got to be part of your thinking if you don't have normal power but um, not with most of it and probably I suppose electricity might be one of your efficiencies if you're talking about irrigation pumps and running them but a lot of the, the field devices are low power devices. Yeah so typically solar powered or just batteries so I, I'd say you're going to save on power because you'll be optimizing your pumping. Um, I think, I think Giuseppe's question's right at the top. Don't know how to get right what is up the overall to response from farmers about these remote monitoring tools? Is it just a financial decision or also a new understood model to be used to manage farms being more efficient? What's the current education level in this industry in terms of people and users to be able to adopt this? Well, if I, if I can tackle the last one first, um, it's very low at the moment, which is part of the focus on education and awareness in our program. Um, there are some stats around that in the precision to decision work they did on ag tech adoption. Uh, and it's been identified that that's one of the gaps as an industry we, we want to address to build that level. Um, our first step to do that is running this program and, and running the ag guide. Um, it's a plain language guide to some high tech type of solutions. So I think just building the, the confidence, understanding some of the language uh, is a challenge. Um, and the first part of it, what's the response? Well, I can only give the response to ba basically our collaborators. Um, and it really depends on the benefits they get. So as I, as I mentioned with the technology that we put out, anything to do with managing water they thought was great. 
water is uh, an expensive and important resource, whether it's livestock or, or cropping. So managing that better for productivity or animal welfare um, measures is, is really important. And then just knowing what's happening around your property. Uh, a, a lot of producers uh, are trying to juggle a lot of balls at once and being able to be confident that one part of their operation is is going well and they don't have to spend a lot of time looking at it. They can divert time to, to another more important part of their business at that point in time. So um, yeah, really about, about time and, and peace of mind and making better decisions. Okay, we've got an anonymous question or an anonymous attendee asking their question. What are your recommended recommendations for water monitoring? Pretty broad. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> it depends <laughs> what you're monitoring, <laughs> whether it's tanks, troughs, river flow, pipe flows, irrigation flows. So uh, really you need to go back to look at what you want to monitor in your water situation and then look at the different technologies available. So there's no one solution I would, would recommend at all. You have to look at each individual situation. Okay, so maybe finally the question is, um, you're gonna be running these or, or setting up these networks and then you're looking for farmers who may want to participate. How do they sort of keep in, uh, in touch to know when the gates will be open to, um, to be able to apply and, and go through that process with yourself? Well, we'll be running some um, pretty intensive communications campaigns early next year. So it's a bit of a uh, watch this space, um, but probably for if they want to just do their own updates, just check that. DPI NSW climate webpage on farms of the future, or just Google New South Wales DPI farms of the future and go there. That's where we're going to be posting the latest information. But in those actual target LGAs, um, we'll be working with local stakeholders in those areas to make sure we get the latest information out. Very good. Well, Scott, thanks very much for today. I think um, our questions have been exhausted and our time is up, but uh, it, was, it was great. And um, it's a great initiative too, obviously, um, to drive this. So, so many thanks for your time today. It's been great. Great, thanks Thank Richard. You. I, I appreciate, appreciate the uh, opportunity to um, give her an update of all the different streams of activity that DPI is doing in that ag tech space. And thanks everyone for coming along too. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. All right, thanks very much.